Welcome to another lab in Network Support Services, Windows Networking. I will be hosting this lab in Hyper-V. You as the student will follow along, answering all questions, and taking the appropriate screenshots as shown in your worksheet. So let's begin. 70-740 Lab 13 Implementing Failover Clustering We're going to be working with four different servers in this. Of course we've got our domain controller running, our LUN DC1. We're also going to be working with SVR1, 2, and 3. So we're going to be creating and configuring an iSCSI target. We'll be configuring the iSCSI client. We'll be installing failover clustering, creating the failover cluster, we'll be configuring a quorum, we'll be implementing clusterware updating in our last exercise. So let's get into it. In exercise one, we'll be creating and configuring an iSCSI target. Starting with Windows Server 2012, you can install the iSCSI target server role so that other Windows servers can provide iSCSI storage to other clients, and this includes other Windows servers. After you install the iSCSI target server role, you use Server Manager to create the volumes that will be presented to the clients and specify which servers can access the iSCSI LUNs. So let's go ahead, we're going to get Server 3 started, and we're going to go ahead and connect to that and wait for that to come up online. Should only take a few moments. And there we are. We're going to go ahead and we'll log in with our typical Datum Administrator credentials. Should only take a moment and we'll be in Server Manager. The first thing that we're going to do is once Server Manager loads, we're going to go to Add a Role and Feature. Just have to wait for it to load. We may get an error if we don't. Add roles and features. We're going to click next, next, and next. And under the server roles, we're going to expand out our file and storage services. We're then going to expand the file and iSCSI storage, the iSCSI services. On that list, we're going to go ahead, we're going to select iSCSI target servers. We've already done this. Remember, we did this in a previous previous lab, but if not, this is what we'd be doing. And we would also select the iSCSI target storage provider. We would click Next and Install and Close. Well, we've already done this. We can just click Cancel. However, if this is the first time installing this feature, you would need to. Let's go ahead and on our Server Manager, on our left column, we're going to select the File and Storage Services node. We're going to drill into that. We're going to select iSCSI and we're going to create a new disk. First thing we're going to do is we're going to say tasks new iSCSI virtual disk. What we're going to do is we're going to simply click next and for the name we're going to type in quorum drive. Yeah, let's do it just like the instructions. We're going to capitalize the D in Drive. We click Next. For the size, we're going to specify 2 gigabytes. We click Next. And we need to specify a new, we're going to make a new, uh, let's see, wait a minute. We've already got our cluster group 1 specified. Let's see if those IP addresses are correct. Uh, we were using different IP addresses the previous time. Let's see, there's that. We want... Nope, we're going to change this. So we're going to use that, but then we're going to modify the cluster group 1. We'll go ahead, we're going to use that. We're going to click Next, and we're going to click Create. And we can click Close. Okay, now that Cluster Group 1, that's down here under the iSCSI target. We're going to right-click that and we're going to go to Properties. 
and on initiators we're going to change the IP addresses that are set for the initiators. We're going to leave the 021 and 022. We're going to leave the 024. The first IP address we're going to modify that. We're going to remove it and we're going to add a different. We're going to add an, not an IQN but an IP address and that value is going to be 172.16.0.60 and we're going to click OK. So now if we sort it by value 21, 22, 24 and 60 those are our four values that are going to be there and we're going to click OK. Now on the top of that screen if we go if we scroll back up we're going to select tasks and we're going to select new iSCSI virtual disk once more. We're going to move that box up so we can see everything. We're going to click next. We're going to name it data drive. We're going to click next. And for the size we're going to specify 8 gigabytes click next and we're going to use that same cluster group one as our target and then we will go ahead and we're going to click next and click create and close so once we've got these two created I'd like you to go ahead and take a screenshot this is going to be your sc first screenshot and paste that into step number 36 once you've got that screenshot, we're, we're going to move ahead and we're going to answer our first question. Question number one is, what is the status of those two virtual disks? You can see it right there in the middle of the screen, virtual under virtual disk status. They are not connected. Your answer to question one obviously is they are not connected. We've got our first question answered. Let's move on to our second exercise. Our second exercise is configuring the iSCSI client. For a failover cluster to function, you need a shared drive. LUN SVR3 is an iSCSI target, which has iSCSI drives that can be used by SVR1 and SVR2. That's where we're going to build our cluster. In this exercise, you will connect to the iSCSI drives using the built-in iSCSI client software that already comes with Windows Server 2016. Understand that failover cluster nodes need to connect to a SAN in order to provide central storage that can be accessed by all nodes within the cluster. We're going to go ahead, we're going to switch back over to our server manager, or our Hyper-V manager, and we'll right-click server 1 and we'll get that started. We'll go ahead and connect to it. Should only take a few moments for it to come up. So one great thing about working with solid states, right? As soon as our server manager loads, we're going to be going to tools and then to iSCSI initiator. Right here. Now it's not running, so you get a message, hey. Server. You can't use it if the service isn't running, so yes, we do want to click yes. Get that service running, and as soon as that service is running, our iSCSI initiator interface will come up, and there it is. In our target box, we're going to type in lun-svr3.adatum.com and select Quick Connect. And there is our discovered target, and that leads us to our second question. What is the IGN of the target? Well, you can see it right there. If I select this little divider and double click on it, you can see the actual target name. I'd like everyone to type that full name into the answer for question two. It is IGN.1991-05.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
we are now showing it as a discovered target that's available and we can close and click OK for our iSCSI initiator properties. Now we're going to go ahead we're going to do we're going to go ahead and we're going to start our server through 2 and we'll be logging into that as well. So we'll go ahead we'll get that up working in our enhanced environment and this is from a previous exercise so I want to switch users should be logged in here in a moment just to like everything else now like I said I've used this for some different exercises so I'm just going to double click my double check my IP address and yes I need to change that IP address that was from a previous lab setup this should be 22 we click OK and OK and I can close that I'll refresh my server manager make sure I can see that yes I do and on here we're going to go to this do the same thing we're going to go into that iSCSI initiator service is not running we need it to be running we're going to do the same thing under the target we're going to we're going to go to quick connect to that LUN SVR3 there it is we can go ahead and click done we are connected and now what we're going to do here is we're going to select volumes and devices and we're going to select auto configure and right there we have connected to those disks that are provisioned on our SVR3 let's take a screenshot showing that those connections and paste that into step 14 in our second exercise all right you've got your screenshot I'm going to click OK and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click the start button and go to disk management on our disk management we can't use those disks if they're not online right right here they are our 2 gig and our 8 gig we're going to right click the 2 gig and we're going to bring it online and we're also going to bring on the 8 gig we're going to right click on the 2 gig and initialize and we're going to click OK because that's going to initialize both of those both our iSCSI disks are online and initialized we're going to right click on our 2 gig volume and select new simple volume we're going to click next next we're going to allow it to sign the drive letter automatically we're going to click next we're going to label this quorum drive and we'll allow it to do the quick format we click next and finish and there's our quorum drive we're going to do the same thing to our 8 gig new simple volume next 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 and we're going to label this data drive we click next and finish we've finished our second exercise let's move on to our third exercise and this is installing failover clustering in this exercise we're going to run the validate cluster configuration wizard and install failover clustering the most common failover cluster is the active passive cluster in an active passive cluster both servers are configured to work as one but only one at a time the active node provides the network services whereas the passive node must wait for something to happen to be the active node it is recommended that before you create a failover cluster you first run the validate the cluster configuration wizard which will analyze and test inventory network storage and system configurations so let's get on to it we're going to go back over to our SVR1 and we've got to add the feature right 
we're going to go to manage add roles and features we're going to click next 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 and on the roles page we're going to click next and we're going to go right here to fill over clustering we're going to select that we're going to add the features we're going to click next and we're going to click install it should only take a few moments and once it's done we're going to go ahead and get a screenshot and paste that into step number eight in our third exercise while that's installing uh, you know what I'm not even going to bother pausing it because it looks like we're almost done already and there it is now we do have to do a restart but get your screenshot if you need to pause the video so you can take that screenshot I'm going to go ahead I'm going to click close and then I'm going to tell SVR1 to restart While that's restarting, I'm going to do the same thing on SVR2. So I'm going to come over here, SVR2, Manage, Add Roles and Features, Next, 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 Failover Clustering, Add the Features, Next, Install. I see that my SVR1 has restarted. I'm going to go ahead and get logged back into that. Don't wait for one thing to be done before you do something else. Multitask, right? Just like our computers can do multiple things, we need to be able to do that as well. Looks like our installation should be done here in just a moment. Okay, now before moving on, we need to modify our Hyper-V environment. I've been using this Hyper-V environment to perform the labs for all three of our textbooks so we need to modify it as we go on what we're going to do is first off we're going to select our DC1 we're going to go to settings and I can see I have a single network adapter I'm going to add another network adapter I'm going to click add and we're going to connect that we don't have it yet I need to make a new network switch so I'm going to click cancel cancel we're going to go to virtual switch manager I'm going to make a internal switch and I'm going to click create and we're going to call this cluster network and I'm going to let's see internal I'm sorry we want to make that a private network we're going to click OK we're going to go back to our DC1 we're going to say new network adapter add cluster network click OK we need to go to our SVR1 settings network adapter add cluster network click OK our SVR2 settings network adapter add cluster network click OK our third settings network adapter add you get it cluster network click OK our server 4 is not turned on but we can still do the same thing we can add a network adapter connect to our cluster network switch and click OK now we're going to jump over into our DC1 and we want to configure that first going to wait here for just a moment let our server manager load and we're fully loaded now you don't worry about these red services and such that's because we've got our our core our win 2016 core server also added in here for management I don't have that turned on that's why we've got some some red there but we're going to go to local server and we can see here's our new adapter so the first thing I, that we're going to do is we're going to go in here and this is the one that's already configured for our main server I want to rename this London Network this way I can distinguish which one's which I'm going to click 
the tab button and type in cluster network. We're going to go ahead, we're going to do the properties. Whoops, that was wrong. Let's go ahead, we'll use the mouse for this. We'll double click and we're going to use the following IP address. For our DC1 for our cluster network, it's going to be 10.200.200.2 and we're going to use a subnet mask of 255.255.255 no gateway. Remember, one system, one gateway. You could have a hundred network adapters on this system, but you can only have one gateway address. We click OK. Doesn't matter. We click OK. Our cluster network is there. We refresh, make sure that it's stuck. Got our correct assignment, and there it is. Let's go ahead. I'm just going to minimize this. We're going to go to our SVR1. We're going to go local server. There's our new Ethernet. We're going to select for our new Ethernet. We're going to right click. We're going to rename cluster network. We're going to right click properties. Following, use the following. It's going to be 10.200.200.3, subnet mass, 255.255.255. We're going to click OK. We're going to click OK. We're going to click Close. We're going to refresh, make sure our settings look correct. Refresh one more time. There it is. We're going to go to our SVR3, or SVR2, rather. It's got a restart pending. Before we restart, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close our disk management. I'm going to select our Ethernet. We're going to right click. We're going to do the same thing. And then while this is restarting, I'm going to go ahead and I will um, get our London 3 assigned for its correct IP. This is SVR2, so it's going to get 10.200.200.4. With same class C subnet mask. We can click OK. I'm going to rename that. This allows our traffic to be separated. There we are. We're in good shape there. We need to get this restarted. And now I want to go over to SVR3. It's right here. We can come up here to our dashboard, the local server. Go ahead and select it. We'll right click. Let's see, this should be our adapter that we're already using. It is. So we're going to rename that London Network. We'll hit tab, name it cluster network, enter, right click properties, IPv4, and assign it 10.200.200.5. We give it the class C subnet mask, press enter, click OK. Close that, refresh, let's make sure it's stuck correctly. Always double check before you move forward. SVR3 gets dot five, that's correct. And we are good there. So we're back to where we were. Let's go ahead and in our SVR1, there's SVR2, SVR3, where's our SVR1? Right here we can see that in our network connections, our cluster network, what is the IPv4 address? Right there it is. The answer for question number three, which IP address is assigned to the cluster network adapter? 10.200.200.3. Put that in for your answer to question number three. We're going to 
go to our SVR2. We need to get logged back in as administrator. We're going to do the same thing. And on the IP address for our cluster network, we're going to select that. On our network properties, we're going to double click on our cluster network. We're going to click our properties. And then we're going to select IPv4. We're going to click Advanced. And before we move on, I'd like you to answer question number four. Which IP address is assigned to the cluster adapter? Well, it's 10.200.200.4. All right. Our next step is we're going to go to Tools. And then we're going to go to Failover Cluster Manager. And we can go ahead and we can close that prompt. We'll bring our cluster manager back up. And what we're going to do is we're going to select validate configuration. We're going to see our validate configuration wizard screen. We're going to click next. For the name, we're going to type in the name of our server. We're going to, that's going to be lun-svr1. We're going to click Add. Oh, I, click, I added two. Well, we need to add two anyhow. But now I'll type in SVR1 and click Add. There's our two servers that are going to be part of our cluster. We're going to click Next. And we're going to let it run all tests and click Next. Now, I bet you I'm going to get an error because this is testing Hyper-V configurations as well. So I'm probably going to need to shut down server 2 and enable the virtualization in, in, uh, extensions because this wants to be able to, to know that Hyper-V can work in your cluster as well. So you know what, before we go forward, because I, I know we're going to get errors, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go to start, I'm going to shut down my server 2. Click OK, and while that shuts down, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up a PowerShell ad by admin prompt. And I need to expose the virtualization ex uh, extensions for this. So it's set VM processor, and that VM name. You guessed it, it's LUN SVR2. And then we use the dash, ex, dash expose virtualization extensions, the space and a dollar sign true that we want to turn it on. We hit enter. It did it. We can exit out of our command prompt. We can now restart our SVR2. We'll wait a few moments for it to come back up. We'll get logged back in. I guess at some point I need to uh, delete that J Bronze as being a local account there. Eh, you know what? I may leave it there because we'll be using it in a later lab in, an, in one of our additional textbooks. Server 2 is coming back up. And once that's back up, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump back over to our SVR1. And on this confirmation screen, we're going to click Next. Our tests are running. We're just going to watch these tests run to see how we progress. The, the idea is for us to get a validated configuration. It's going to take a few moments. I don't want to pause. I, I want you to be able to see the process. So while our test is running, here again, depending on when you're watching this, maybe get yourself a, 
a nice cold drink, get yourself another cup of coffee, maybe something to munch on. We're just watching for their, our test to continue on. We can see we still have a lot of things that are pending and tests are passing, they're passing. We're moving on, validating, testing, validating, testing. So far, hey, everything's looking good so far. It's bringing those, des those disks online, test them, make sure that, see, it's testing simultaneous failover. It's making sure everything's going to work the way we want it to work once we build the cluster. Here's some additional tests. Just about done with that there, it finished. Now we're rolling through those tests. We're going through them pretty quickly now. Now, software updates, we may get in we may get a warning there. We haven't updated this these machines. So this goes back to our lesson. You want those machines to be exact mirrors of each other. It should be the same hardware. Same operating system version, same patch level version, same network interfaces, same disk configurations. They need to be identical, or as, at least as close to identical as possible. So I'm going to pause the video while it's doing this software update test, because this may take a couple minutes, and then I'm going to jump the video back in once we get past that point. Okay, so... We moved through there. It did pass our software updates. Drivers are good. System information. Now it's testing unassigned drivers. Passed through there. We're rolling. We got a lot of green. We're looking good so far. May not know until the very end, though. It may have had a warning or an error that we didn't see. Now it's looking for those software update levels. This is where it's gathering more information. So we need to make sure that this passes. See, there's still some that are pending. And here's those Hyper-V ones that are still pending. Still got a number of tests. Here again, while it's doing these software update level tests, I'm going to pause the video. Okay, and there it did throw us an error on those software level updates. We're probably going to be able to ignore that. So... Now it's running those validate IP configurations, the cluster configuration. I know I normally pause the video, but usually it's something because we can't really see what's going on. We're just installing a feature or a role. This is important. Understand what's going on. All the different things it takes to make clustering work. This goes into that planning, making sure that you're using similar hardware, that nothing is going to cause you a problem when it goes time to implement your plan. Okay, Hyper-V role installed. Hey, you know what? I may have exposed the virtualization extensions, but I bet I didn't install the Hyper-V role on that second server. So let's take a look here. Validated, validated, success, success, lots of successes, right? Well, it couldn't do, we don't have a fiber channel SAN, so it couldn't do that. And right there, Hyper-V role installed failed. If we view the report, we can see what's there. And right here, Hyper-V configuration, Hyper-V role installed. It's installed on server one, but not server two. So let's go ahead and we're going to take care of that. These are the type of things that you're going to run into. Hey, you may have just missed a step. Let's get that Hyper-V role installed. We don't necessarily have to configure it, but we've got to get it installed. It's on one, right? Forgot that. Hey, we didn't need to do this over on two. Two is where we had the problem. So we'll go add roles and features. Next, next, next. Select Hyper-V. Add the features. Click next, click next, click next. And we're going to use it on our London network. We have to have at least one switch identified for it, right? We're going to click next. We'll click next. Next. 
will install and now I am going to pause the video while that installs you don't need to sit here and watch that because after we're done we're going to need to do a restart remember okay be back in a moment okay so Hyper-V is installed we're going to go ahead and we're going to click close and we need to do a restart should only take a few moments it's just got to finish its configuration get a restart and we'll be back up and then we can rerun that validation And this time I am confident it will successfully complete. So there it finished up its installation, it's restarting, and now we should be able to uh, get, yep, yep, there's our logon prompt. Should only take a few more moments for our server manager to finish loading. While that's going on, let's get a whole, go back over to our tools and our failover cluster manager. I'm going to say don't show that message again. We're, well, we're not going to use the admin center. And yep, our server manager is up. And we'll run our validate cluster wizard once more. For server, SVR1. Second server, SVR2. And we're going to click Next. And we're going to run all those tests. And this time I am going to go ahead and I'm going to pause the video while they all run and then we'll come back to it. We already saw this happen once. We don't need to see it, see it again. It's rolling through them. It's, it's going to go through. But uh, here again, I don't think you need to sit here and watch it do it again. You'll be able to have plenty of opportunities sometime in the future to sit and watch something scroll by your screen. Okay, well our test completed and we still failed. So we need to view the report. Now it's important to, to do these reports and be able to keep them if for no other reason than documentation. What happens if later on something changes and your cluster fails? You need to be able to have a baseline to go back to to compare. That's why reporting and documentation is so important. So let's go back to our here. Okay, network resource pool and virtual switch compatibility. Okay, so our SVR1, we've got some switch issues. So what we're going to need to do is we need to make sure that we can communicate properly. Everything else I believe is okay. Okay, our SVR1, here's our London network. Here's our V Ethernet, that's for our Hyper-V. And you know what? I bet it needs to get a get assigned to a switch. There's our cluster network. Our Hyper-Vs wouldn't be able to communicate in the cluster if they're not on a switch. That might be our problem. Let's go back up to the top here. Missing a virtual, okay, right? Virtual switch is present on at least one other node. Okay, either remove the virtual Ethernet switch from all nodes or ensure it's present on all nodes. Okay, that's our, that's our problem. Our SVR1 is missing the internal switch. Okay, SVR2 is missing that internal switch. This is important. Let's go ahead, let's take a look here. Here we've got this. There's our SVR2. There, here is our SVR1. I'm going to minimize. I'm not going to close out that report. Here I will finish finish that and minimize our cluster setup. I'm going to make this side by side so we can see what's going on here. Well, first off, over here, this adapter does not have 
the IPv4 or IPv6 running, so we're going to go ahead and let get that running. Let's see what happened here. It's giving us an 176. Let's look over here. Ah, oh, this is getting an APIPA. There's our problem. They're on two different networks. Now the question is, how do we get that on the same? So the so the the statement from our report, what did it tell us? Right here. Either remove the virtual Ethernet switch from all nodes or ensure that it's present on all nodes. So we've got two choices. We can remove it or we can make it present. See right here? This is on a private switch. This is on a virt this is just on a, a Hyper-V virtual switch. So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna take a checkpoint on both of these. That way I can make changes and revert them back and know that I won't have any problems. So I'm gonna do a checkpoint on one. one. I'm going to do a checkpoint on two. And what we're going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to say disable. I'm going to go over to SVR1 and I'm going to go to those network connections and I'm going to say disable. I'm wondering if that's going to be enough to fix it. I'm not going to save the report. If we were doing this in a production environment, I would be do I would definitely be saving that report. Let's rerun the validate configuration. I know this is getting to be a long video, but it's important to understand these things. Ah, it's going to have communication problems with that SVR2. It doesn't want to, for some reason, it's not communicating. It should be able to. Let's see if it was able to. Nope, it's having problems connecting to that SVR2. That's interesting. Should be able to. Oh, there it did. Okay. Let's click Next. We're going to run all the tests. Here again, I'm going to pause the video. You don't need to watch all this. I'm pausing the video. We'll be back as soon as they're done. Okay, well, I got the same error again about the, the virtual Ethernet switch. Everything else is passing except our Hyper-V configuration. So what I'm going to do is the next time that I run this, I'm only going to run the Hyper-V configuration because I know everything else is being successful. So that won't take as long. So I'm going to click Finish. And like I said, I made those checkpoints. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to, um, let's see, it's already disabled. Okay, I think I figured out the problem. On our SVR1, when we were doing our Hyper-V exercises earlier in the course, I created an internal switch. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to remove that so that I've only got a private switch on it. And let's see, can I remove that? Okay, there it's there. And in fact, we need to, right, our configurations need to be the same on both. Remember that? So if I go into Tools and I go into Hyper-V Manager, here... I need to go into my virtual switch manager and I need to create a private switch so that it matches what I'm doing over on the other one. And I'll click OK. So now I've got a private switch here and I've got a private switch here. Let's see if we can rerun our validate cluster configuration and see if that did the job, did the trick. There's one and here is SVR2. We're going to click Next. And like I said, I'm only going to run the Hyper-V test. 
So we're going to uncheck everything except for Hyper-V. And no. Come on. View report. Well, we're only getting the one one error now. LUN SVR1. It's missing a virtual switch. It's present on at least other one other node. Did I did did I not re-enable that? You know what? That may be what it is. I may not have. It's it's not even there. So how do we recreate that virtual network switch? It disappeared now because I got rid of the internal, evidently. Well, now this is this is a problem, right? This is troubleshooting. Virtual switch manager, we've got a private switch. What's it connected to? Okay, private network. Let's look over here. Virtual switch manager. Private. Now, you see we've got this right here. Hyper-V network adapter virtual switch. Let's see, does that exist over here? It doesn't. How do we recreate that? Do we want to recreate it? See, this is hooked to the external network. We don't even need that. Let's go ahead and remove that and apply. And click OK. So that leaves us with a private switch on this one and a private switch on this one. Well, that's a Hyper-V manager. A private switch on this one. All right. Now the, the configurations should be the same. Will it work? Let's finish. Validate configuration. Next. Yeah, I know this is getting tedious, right? I want to get this done with. We want to move on. This is why it's so critical that hardware has to be the same. Let's get rid of these other checks. We just want to make sure our Hyper-V finishes. There! Bingo! Validated success, success, success. We're good. Everything else previously tested of, tested fine. The only changes we made were to Hyper-V. We should be fine. I'm not going to rerun the whole thing again, but let's create cluster. On the create cluster, we're going to click next on the wizard screen. We have to add our two servers in. Finally, we get to move on, right? There's our two servers that are going to be part of the cluster. We're going to click next. We're going to call it cluster one. But this is the issues that you need to be able to resolve. Now, we're going to change we're going to, in our instructions, it says that we should be using a, a, a class B address. But what's our, what, what are we on? Are we on a class B or are we on a class C? Hmm? What is it? I know our cluster network's on a class C. What about our, our main London network? We're on a class C there also. So we're going to, we're going to forget about those, what those instructions say in our worksheet about the slash 16. I'm going to leave it the slash 24. What we have to do is we have to click here to type an address and we're going to sign 60. Remember we did that when we were when we were configuring that cluster group. This is going to be the address for the cluster. Remember when you connect to a cluster you're connecting to a name and an address for the cluster not for the individual nodes. We're going to click next. We should get a confirmation screen. We do. We click next. It's going to create the cluster. It should be rest registering it. Register, it should be re registering it in our Active Directory. The name is going to be cluster one. The IP address that's going to be associated with it is the dot sixty. Right there we are. And we click finish. And we've got a cluster going. Let's go ahead and expand our carrot beside cluster one dot dot com. And then I'm going to I'm going to also uh, go under storage and we're going to select disks. 
There's no items found. Where are they? So why are there no discs? Look over here on SVR2. Remember we did the iSCSI initiator? Well, did we ever do that over here? We never did that over here, did we? If we did, what we what happened was we went ahead and re-rebooted. I mean, here's our mount points. Did we ever did we ever initialize or bring those disks online and initiate them? Or initialize them? Don't think we did. Can't connect to them if they're not if they're not online. Right there we are. It's offline. Online. Online. There's our disks. We can close this out. Now if we go back into here and we refresh, let's see if we get anything. What if we add disk? There's our disk. We can add to the cluster. They weren't there initially. That's why we have to add them this way. And there we are. Cluster disk 1, cluster disk 2, 8 gig and 2 gig. We should be in good shape. Go ahead and take a screenshot and paste this into step number 39. If you've got your screenshot, we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump over to our DC1. And what we're going to do is we're going to go up and we're going to take a look at our DNS. We're going to expand our forward-looking zone. We're going to expand our datum. And what we're going to do is in a datum, we're going to create we actually, we don't need to. Right there it is. There's our cluster 1 with a 0 0.60 address. If it doesn't exist, what you'd want to do is you'd want to go right click and go new host and you type in cluster 1 and you'd put that 172.16.0.60 address in there and click create add host. And that's how you would manually do it. Well, we've already done that. I may have had that left over from a previous exercise. If it didn't exist, you would need to do it. So this ends exercise four. Our fifth exercise is configuring a quorum. Since you only have two nodes, you will create a quorum using a disk witness. A quorum is used with a failover cluster to determine the number of failures that the cluster can sustain. If a quorum, and that's the majority of the votes, is not reached, the cluster will stop running. Each voting element contains a copy of the cluster configuration. And now this does not include the cloud and file share witness. And the cluster service works to keep all copies synchronized at all times. Let's jump over. We can minimize our DC1. We don't need to have DNS open anymore. On server 1, what we're going to do is in our cluster manager, we're going to select the nodes. And we do see our two nodes, and they're both up. We can now look under storage. We can go back into disks. And after we select disk, we can see our two disks that are online. I made this a little bit bigger so that we can have a little bit better view. We can see our disk 1, which is our data disk, and our disk 2, which is our quorum drive. And you can see that here. So the data drive, it's available storage. The second disk, our 2 gig, that's our quorum drive. That's our witness. So one disk is available storage, and the other disk is our disk witness in the quorum. What we're going to do, that's your answer to question number five. One is available for storage. The other is your witness in your quorum drive. We're going to right click on cluster1.adatum.com and I'm going to select more actions and I'm going to select configure cluster quorum settings. In our wizard screen, like everything else, we click next and we're going to select Advanced Quorum Configuration and click Next. Under Selecting Voting Configuration, 
we're going to click next and then for selecting a quorum witness we're going to select configure a disk witness and click next and we're going to select that two gig disk that was our second one or that's you can expand the plus to make sure see there's our two gig one we're going to click the check there that'll select that as our quorum we click next we click next and we click finish now when we look there now we can see that that quorum drive is flagged as a disk witness let's go ahead and take a screenshot and paste this into step number 11 and we're done with our exercise 5 so let's move on to exercise 6 which is implementing clusterware updating in this exercise we're going to go ahead we're going to install and enable clusterware updating when updates need to be applied to nodes in a cluster you must ensure that all nodes get the same update clusterware update, updating will schedule the updates to be deployed to a cluster we're going to go over to our SVR3 this is where we're going to start out and on SVR3 we're going to go manage add roles and features we're going to click next 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 on the roles page we're going to click next and we're going to scroll down to we see remote server administration tools and we're going to expand that we're then going to expand the feature administration roles and we're going to expand the failover clustering tools we want to select the failover cluster management tools we want to select the cluster over mod cluster module for Windows PowerShell the automation server and the command interface we're going to go ahead and we're going to click next and install once that's done we're going to go ahead and we'll click close once the installation finishes and then we're going to be going back up to our tools and we're going to select clusterware updating that's what this will allow us to have should take just a few more moments and we'll be done like I said this is one of the longer labs we had difficulties there that cost us some time but it would have still been a long lab okay we're done we can click close go to tools and we go to clusterware updating right there the first thing we need to tell it what cluster we want to connect to well we want to collect connect to cluster one we click connect there it is the nodes appear and we're going to go ahead and we're going to click configure cluster self updating options so let's see if it's ready for us to do that or not we're going to do next we're going to say add the CAU cluster where updating clustered role this will add it to the cluster and after we click next we're going to answer our next question question number six by default how often are clusters scheduled for update well what's the frequency of self updating listed right there monthly and you could specify what day time and time of the month that you want this to occur so answer to question six is monthly we're going to go ahead we're going to click next on the advanced options we're going to let it fill it in we're simply going to click next At, on the additional update options we click next on the confirmation page we're going to click apply and once we are successful in adding that cluster aware updating clustered role with the self updating enabled we get our we're going to get our completion we're going to take a screenshot but you gotta wait there it is success go ahead take a screenshot and paste that into step number 20 if you got that screenshot we're going to go ahead and we're going to click close and we're done with enabling the cluster aware updating
that is everything we need to do. We're done. I'm going to go ahead and close the screen there. We've enabled cluster aware updating. We've got a cluster that's av available. Now, you say, where's that cluster at? Well, remember, here it is. We can view it here on server one. Well, what happens if we look over here to server two and we go to, over to our failover cluster manager? There's our same information. We haven't configured any roles, but we've got a two node cluster. And there they are. We should see the same disk configuration. There it is. I'd like to thank you for doing this lab, uh, lab 13 and 70-740. And I'll see you in the next lab or lesson.